Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 10 of the OpenStack Psychology textbook. My name is Matthew Poole and today we're going to be going over motivation and emotion. So what we're going to be doing throughout this chapter is distinguishing the difference between motivation and emotion as well as we are going to look at different theories of both motivation and emotion. So whenever it comes to motivation we can usually distinguish them in between intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation so we're gonna dive more into that and then move on to the theories so to give uh, a definition to motivation it's the wants or needs that direct behavior toward a goal so we all have intrinsic versus extrinsic motivating factors in our life now to distinguish between the two intrinsic motivation are items that motivate us due to internal factors. So this can be due to a number of or a variety of factors such as autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Some people may be scrolling and finding this YouTube video and are wanting to learn more about motivation and emotion for their own understanding and that could be and that is due to intrinsic motivation. Now if you're stumbling upon this video because it is a part of my course because I do have these videos public but I also show them to my class and give them to my class for understanding of each chapter um, then they are doing this because of extrinsic motivation, likely. Now, some people in college, they are taking particular courses for personal mastery or for, for personal fulfillment, and uh, that's perfectly fine. That would be an intrinsic motivator, but most of my students are in college because of one or two things. They want to get a degree, which again is an extrinsic motivator, and or they want to get a job with that degree that will lead them to a more fruitful or, let me just say, uh, toward a job that they particularly want okay uh, and for some students they may just be here because their parents are making them and that's okay too uh, anything that's an extrinsic motivator is something that derives from outside sources so this is why we all go to our jobs so we can receive uh, compensation for those who are in school so we can receive grades that ultimately lead to a degree and then can lead to a job or a career that we want that yields the potential for um, for higher earning now, whenever it comes to intrinsic motivation, this is why a lot of us engage in the hobbies that we do. You know, we don't make an income from our hobbies necessarily. Most of us at least don't. Some of us take our hobbies and turn them into uh, a career. But whenever it comes to our hobbies, there's some sort of personal fulfillment that we get from them. So that's why we engage in the hobbies that we do. They're enjoyable inherently. So that's the main difference between intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. So just a moment ago, I mentioned taking your hobby and turning it into a career. Should you do that? I mean, it makes sense. Do what you love as a career, right? But studies show that whenever you begin to take something that was once intrinsic, intrinsically motivating for you and turning it into an extrinsic motivation, such as turning it into a business and receiving compensation for it, the intrinsic value of that uh, particular hobby or action tends to decline. Right. So whenever you if you let's say that you like to bake in your free time, you're an accountant through the day, but you like to come home and you like to bake. Well, whenever you t uh, decide to open up your own bakery and start to re receive compensation for it and you're doing it all day, every day, operating a business, you know, conflating, uh, you know, your career and, and and things like that with something that's enjoyable inherently on your own time can lead to a, a, a sense of, I don't want to say burnout, but it can definitely make you not want to do it in your free time. Because if you're baking all day, every day, are you going to want to come home and bake? I hope that you do, and I hope that's the case. I hope you love it that much. But studies show that that uh, does tend to happen for people who take intrinsic, uh, intrinsically motivating um, hobbies or behaviors, I guess you can say, and then start to receive extrinsic motivators as a result. Okay, so now let's talk about the instinct theory of motivation. So William James, as we've talked about in previous chapters, he's an earlier psychologist that uh, gave us a lot of insight into the field of, of psychology. 
Now, he proposed the instinct theory of motivation, which asserts that behavior is driven by our instincts, which aid survival. So remember, William James is a big proponent for the for a theory of evolution and that the strongest survive through natural selection. And so he thinks that what motivates us is ultimately through engaging in behaviors that aid survival, which can help which will help us to survive and advance our genetics. And so he proposed that instincts included a mother's protection of her baby, again, to survive in advance and continue the genetic uh, code of their family, the urge to lick sugar and hunting prey. Okay, this theory received criticism, though, for ignoring the role of learning in shaping human behavior. So how do different environmental factors, uh, you know, promote you to behave in the way that you do. So it's not just about survival, critics say. It's about how environmental factors can influence you to do things that are not necessarily advantageous for survival. Okay, let's talk about the drive theory of motivation. This theory proposes that we're always trying to maintain a level of homeostasis. So to put quite simply, homeostasis is what keeps us at even kill. So if we're hungry, then we eat. If we're thirsty, we drink. And so we're always trying to maintain a particular level of homeostasis. But my critique with this theory is well, why do we eat or drink whenever we're not hungry or thirsty? There seems to be other motivating factors that propel us to do so, either due to being in social settings or, you know, social influences that propel us to drink or eat whenever we, um, whenever we're not hungry or thirsty. Whenever we go to over to somebody's house or we go get go to a get together, and some uh, some people will. Uh, say just immediately when you walk through the door would you like a glass of water or would you like something to drink because it's just a polite thing to do and most of us um, in that particular station just situation accept the drink just you know because it's a nice offering and you know there's social I don't want to say pressures but there's a social aspect to it that propel you to be like yeah sure I'll, I'll take a, a, a glass of water or whatever the case is okay even though we're not inherently you know, thirsty in that very moment. We're not dying of thirst in that moment. We still will take, we still will drink the provided beverage. Okay, let's talk about the arousal theory of motivation. This theory may, se may seem like it overlaps with the previous one, but let me show you how it differs. So the arousal theory asserts that there's an optimal, ele optimal level of arousal that we're all trying to maintain. So in this instance, and it, and it makes sense in a lot of cases for me whenever I look at it from a macro perspective. In life, whenever we're under aroused uh, or just bored, okay, we tend to seek out something that will bring us to a level of stimulation. I think our phones are a great example of this because in day-to-day -day life, like most of the moments in our life tend to be pretty boring. It's not all you know excitement all the time. Okay, and so whenever we are bored, let's say we're uh, driving in a car, or, or not that we're driving, but somebody is driving us in, in a car, or we're on a train, or what, we're in a meeting, whatever the case is, whenever we're bored in that particular moment, we tend to have an urge to want to pick up our phone and uh, look at social media or uh, read a book, whatever the case is, because it will at least return us some, to some level of stimulation. Now, alternatively, whenever we're over aroused, so if we're in a, a situation that's that's uh, highly anxiety provoking, we tend to seek out behaviors that neutralize or bring us back to more so an optimal level. So individuals can do this in illegal, I guess you could say, or legal way. So legally speaking, you know, trying to engage in some sort of relaxation technique through uh, breath work um, and things like that. And some people may engage in illegal or legal, but probably maybe not appropriate in that situation, substances. So especially in social settings for individuals who have social anxiety disorder, they have a higher propensity for wanting to engage with alcohol to uh, kind of ease their anxiety a little bit to not be so overly anxious to where they're not able to operate in that social setting. Okay, and so that comes to the... Um, let excuse me, let's finish this theory up with talking about the yerk stotson Law. And because of this, going off to talk about alcohol, so whenever we're in a highly anxious situation, um, usually our ability to perform and our ability to operate as best we can tends to become compromised because uh, let's say like you're in an athletic event, you're playing basketball, 
and it's a very important game or, you know, it's just a game in general. And the crowd tends to make you nervous, it makes you overly anxious or your coach or your teammates. The pressure is just a lot on you in that moment. So your ability to operate as best you can may become hindered because the anxiety is taking over. All right, and so that's very much the Yerkes Dotson law. Tasks are performed best when the arousal levels are in the middle range of this bell curve, whereas with difficult tasks, uh, best performed under low levels of arousal. With difficult tasks, excuse me, being performed under low levels of arousal, and simple tasks being performed under higher levels of arousal. So whenever it comes to basketball, it's a very complex sport. It's not as simple as uh, you know pouring a glass of water, right? It's a very simple task that would be easy to do for most people, even under very high intensity situations or high stress situations. But with basketball, it's moving so quickly. You have to think on your feet, you're running, you're, um, you're having to strategize in the moment and you've got all these other social pressures on you. So your, your anxiety may make you not be as productive as you could be. Now it's normal to have uh, pre-game jitters, right? That is what's allowing you to be at more so this optimal level. It's an excitement of sorts, and but for but for some, our brain will kind of kind of uh, interpret that as anxiety or jitters, and so it's good because it allows you to be and to perform the best that you possibly can. It's not so much the anxiety hasn't taken over so much to where you underperform or perform not to the best of your abilities. It's just allowing you to be in that mental state of where you're aware and you are your body's motivated to do the best that it can. Now, if you're playing a basketball game, you don't want to be so unanxious or so under aroused that you're bored or apathetic. That's like watching TV shows because if you're just if your brain is only being utilized is only under you know a, is in a boredom state in a basketball game, I kind of question what maybe uh, we'd have to look into that a little bit more because you know you probably won't care as much. You won't care about the strategy or care about the end moment, so you may not uh, you you're not motivated to perform better than you could. So in this essence, and especially when I teach in front of a classroom, I've got a, a good portion of people looking at me and hanging on to the words that I'm saying. So I'm trying to be as cautious as possible about what I'm saying so that uh, I'm explaining the material in as simplistic of a manner as I possibly can that's also understandable, okay? Because I don't want to be teaching and have just and I'm just like completely bored or don't care at all because I may miss stuff to talk about or I may not explain things to the best of my ability. Right. Whenever I'm watching just whatever you know TV show that's mind numbing, you know I'm. It's there for a reason. It's good in, in in small doses and everything, but it's not a place to be whenever you're performing tasks that need your uh, best capability and uh, ability in the moment. All right. Moving forward, let's talk about self-efficacy and social motivation. So when it comes to self-efficacy, this is an individual's belief in their own capability to complete a task. This is important for motivation according to Albert Bandura because if you believe that you can complete a task, of course you're going to uh, want to be want to start engaging in that task because um, if you just don't think you could even do it in the first place, it's unlikely that you're going to want to be motivated to engage in that particular activity or task or goal. Okay. Now, Bandura also states that we have that we all share at least these three social motives: so the need for achievement, the need for affiliation, and the need for intimacy. When it comes to the need for achievement, right? We we all want to achieve in life according to Bandura, achieve a goal or task. That's why a lot of us are in college right now uh, to be able to achieve that degree and achieve a successful career. This was what drives accomplishment and performance. Now, on top of this, we have the need for affiliation. This encourages positive interactions with other people. So we want to be affiliated with a group. And this isn't really particularly focused on uh, tribal behavior, but back in the day, you know, if we wanted to survive in advance, we likely had to be a part of a tribe because when there's more of us, the uh, factors that can limit our ability to survive in advance decreases, right? Because if you're out all on your own, it's all up to you. The likelihood of you surviving are a, a good bit lower than with a group. 
But in today's modern world, we still have that need for affiliation, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in-person groups, although largely it is. A lot of us have different groups that we appeal to uh, online or uh, through social um, and online groups that and ideologies, so politics or theories, um, religion, things like that. So we, according to Bandura, we all still seek a need for affiliation. It's just innate to us. It may just not look the same as it did uh, hundreds of years ago. Now, on top of this, or even thousands. Now, the, on top of this, the need for intimacy. So this is what causes us to seek deep, meaningful relationships, be they partnerships, romantic relationships, or friendships. Um, that is a, a big proponent, according to Bandura. We want to uh, have a group, uh, especially a family, in his eyes, where we continue to advance our uh, our family tree and things like that. But also having friendships that go beyond surface level. Okay, moving forward, we have th what's known as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So his name is Abraham Maslow, and he proposed that theory of motivation that spans the spectrum of motives, including biological, individual, as well as social. And according to Bandura, of course this makes sense, how are we to worry about self-worth, accomplishment, and confidence if we don't know where our next meal is coming from. So he sees motivation in the sense of a hierarchy. Once we've achieved food, water, shelter, and warmth, then we can move to security, which includes safety, employment, and assets. Then we can move on to the social aspect of life, which includes family, friendship, intimacy, and belonging. Next, as I mentioned, uh, self-esteem, your self-worth, your accomplishment, and your confidence. And then the pinnacle of this hierarchy is being self-actualized or achieving inner fulfillment where you can look at yourself and, and state that you accomplish what you want to and you're satisfied with all of the following categories. All right. Now that we have distinguished motivation, let's talk about emotion. So we're going to look at some theories of motivation and some topics related to it. It's important to distinguish, especially in an intro class, the difference between emotion versus mood. So when it comes to your mood, mood is a very much prolonged, it's less intense state, but you may, and as well, you may not even re consciously recognize that you're experiencing this particular mood. And it doesn't occur in response to something that we experience, right? So it is a prolonged, less intensive state. You may not even recognize it, and it's not inherently a response to a particular event. Now, emotion is the exact opposite in this case. So emotion is, it occurs very briefly comparatively to mood, so it happens briefly, uh, and it's intensive. So it, we ex we can actually consciously experience it and understand it, and it does happen in response to a particular event. So if we have something unfortunate happen to us and we are sad, we will experience that very intensely, and then obviously through consciously experiencing it through tears or other uh, actions. We know that we're experiencing a, an emotion whenever it happens. Okay, So that's the main difference between mood versus emotion. All right, let's look at some theories of emotion. So firstly, we have James Lang theory. We have the Cannon Bard theory. As well, we've got the Schachter Singer two-factor theory, as well as the Lazarus Cognitive Mediational theory. Now those are, for your studying purposes, you can go back and look at them in particular, but I want to show you this visual because it may help you out in understanding it in its entirety because I'm a visual learner and I know some people may be more so visual versus uh, verbal and so if you're a verbal learner then you can go back on, on in the last two slides there pause the video and read throughout them but if you're visual like me let's go through this slide together so when it comes to the James Lang theory so James Lang theory states that we have an arousal situation then we will have the physiological experience of the heart pounding and the sweating and then we will experience the fear uh, and, aka the emotion so it happens the event or the arousal situation, then we have the physiological response, and then we have uh, the emotion. So one, two, three. Now the Cannon Bard theory states that we have this arousal situation, and then we have both the heart pounding 
uh, sweating, physiological uh, arousal happening at the same time as the emotion does. Okay. Now, the Schachter-Singer two-factor theory, this states that we have a particularly arousing situation like seeing a snake. We will have the heart pounding and sweating, and then we will label it or appraise it. Okay. So we uh, what's happening at the same time is the uh, physiological response as well as we are labeling it in the moment. Is this a uh, situation to be scared of or not? And then we will experience the emotion. When it comes to the Lazarus cognitive mediational theory, this is whenever we'll have the arousing event. Then we will have the uh, appraisal of should I be scared or not. Okay, And then we have what's is the physiological pound, uh, physiological response of a, a pounding heart, fear, uh, as well as sweating. So all of it together. So uh, arousal situation, appraising it, and then the physiological as well as the emotional response. Okay, let's talk about the cultural display rule. So culturally specific standards that govern the types and frequencies of displays of emotion that are acceptable. That's the, the, the cultural display rule. So here in the United States, uh, we are encouraged to express negative emotions like fear, anger, and disgust, both alone and in the presence of others. We have a, we have a big push for individuals seeking out therapeutic treatment and, uh, and talking with a counselor or even seeking the guidance of your family and your friends. We, all, we don't necessarily uh, like to encourage people to bottle things up because we know whenever you just deal with things alone, that can lead to the fruition of mental difficulties and uh, maladaptive behaviors to cope with that, uh, with those negative emotions as a result. And so we're a very much me culture here in the U.S., here in the western part of the world. But in the eastern part of the world and in Asian culture, specifically in Japan, they only express these negative emotions while alone so as not to burden the group. Um, again, where they're very much a we culture, bringing in those emotions may compromise the group. And, and so that's uh, why they're encouraged to deal with it in their own time and in their own privacy. Okay, on top of this, we have seven universal facial expressions that uh, are cross-cultural. So you can kind of see it here in this figure 1024. The cultural, or excuse me, the universal facial expressions include happiness, surprise, sadness, fright, disgust, contempt, as well as anger. Okay, so those are the universal facial expressions of emotion. Now, to conclude, we're going to talk about the facial feedback hypothesis. I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments if you agree with it or not. The facial uh, feedback hypothesis includes the definition of facial expressions are capable of influencing our emotion. So do you think just smiling makes you happy or does being happy make you smile? Now, the research it can be a little bit... They can differ, but <clears throat> your textbook states in the OpenStax Psychology textbook that depressed individuals reported less depression after a paralysis of their frowning muscles with Botox injection. So does faking it till you make it really apply whenever it comes to your emotions? Let me know in the comments. I'm curious of your opinions. So that's going to conclude Chapter 10 of the OpenStax Psychology textbook. I'll see you in the next one, Chapter 11, for personality. Have a great day.